now. So yes, I see the light, Gabriele. <laughs> it's recording, and I think uh, if I knew or if I remember Zoom correctly, I think everybody gets a note of that. Yes, uh, thank thank you very much, and uh, I'm very welcome you all to this webinar. My name is Stanislav Shukailov. I'm the an associate editor of the CDM Mathematics Education, and today also editor in chief Gabriele Kaiser uh, participated in this uh, meeting. And I'm very happy to introduce our fourth webinar of CD Mathematics Education. Um, uh, there were also three other uh, webinars on different topics on COVID-19 pandemic, on emotions and motivation. And uh, the third one was on conceptualizing teachers' interactions with resources in crossing languages and cultures. And uh, today uh, the topic is exploring and strengthening university mathematics courses for secondary teacher preparation. Uh, this special issue was edited by Orly Buchbinder, Nick Wassermann and, Nick, and Nils uh, Buchholz. So um, um, we are happy that the guest editors offered this uh, webinar today and I hand over to them, Nils, uh, Nick, uh, Orly, you can take over and start the webinar. Yes, thank you very much, um, Stanislav. Um, Nick has already shared the screen here and you see our at the beginning of our slides and we have prepared a little bit um, that we have some of the authors of papers and invited them to this webinar to present some of the work. And um, I'm Niels, I'm one of the co-editors and you will see Nick and Orly also in a minute, I guess. Yeah, and I start with a short introduction of our motivation to do this um, special issue. And first of all, it's good to say we were very, very happy that we had this opportunity to be able to make this special issue to our topic that really lies, I think, in all of our hearts to strengthen the university teacher education and uh, build and showing the research and also the activities that a lot of instructors have done in their mathematics courses to shape some relations from the university mathematics to teaching and to school mathematics, in short. Our motivation took um, the beginning that a lot of researchers agree, and maybe we all agree about that the strong mathematical knowledge base is a prerequisite for teaching mathematics at the secondary level, and also its relation to pedagogical content knowledge. However, we have that sometimes as experiences from anecdote, uh, anecdotes when students say this to us, or there is even um, empirical studies that report about the often minimal value that secondary uh, teacher students see in the mathematics they learn at the university when the, it comes to relating this university mathematics to their later teaching profession and classroom teaching and that often also causes uh, often also causes motivational problems for students and sometimes even they stop uh, studying for teaching at all and quit studying or study something else which is often a cat catastrophe now this is a problem that is not new it's already um, at a hundred, over 100 years old if we go back to felix klein um, in, in his work already in 1908, um, he wrote about the so-called double discontinuity. And this is the gap, and he describes the gap prospective teachers' experience in their transition to and from university mathematics studies. I'm sure many of you have heard of this term he coined, and the uh, his works were recently translated um, again, the three books about um, elementary mathematics from an advanced standpoint uh, in a new edition um, where you could read his program that he already um, invented at the beginning of the last century. And with this as a background, we as guest editors, we felt the need to address the variety of initiatives that university instructors have developed to strengthen these connections between university mathematics and school mathematics and to provide pre or in-service teachers 
with a range of mathematical and didactical experience that relate more to their professional practice. We, we discussed this and we found out that's a problem that arises all around the world. And that is not a specific problem that occurs in one country or another. So that was also the motivation for us as an international team to um, work together and collaboratively um, um, assemble a set of really nice articles and from researchers all around the world um, that really try to take measures and to uh, invent things in their lectures, in their mathematical courses, to shape these relations between the university mathematics and the teaching profession, especially for teacher students. And Nick, I think you might now switch to the next slide. So Nick will give you now an overview about the papers that we assembled for this special issue. Perfect. Thanks, Neil. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Nick Wasserman, one of the guest editors for the special issue. Um, one uh, brief note before I uh, start is uh, how we'll proceed. We'll have uh, a couple of talks and we will take questions and have a panel of discussion question and answers at the end. If you have questions about particular things as we're going along, feel free to add those to the chat. Niels will help coordinate um, you know, question and answer time um, towards the end. But uh, I think I get the fun job, uh, which is getting a chance to welcome uh, and congratulate um, uh, everyone uh, who's here in attendance, but especially the authors. We are so grateful for your contributions uh, to this special issue, and we really want to celebrate um, all the work that has gone into this uh, and, and everyone's contribution to this special issue. Uh, in short, I think it's a really nice collection of papers, um, and, it, and I think it makes a genuine con contribution to this special issues theme, which is around exploring and strengthening the university math courses for secondary teacher preparation. So on the screen, you'll see a list of authors and uh, title papers. Uh, and what we'd like to start with is just giving a brief summary uh, of, of the different papers so that if you haven't had a chance to read them, maybe some will pique your interest uh, and you'll dig a little bit further. Those with an asterisk will be uh, sharing more later on in this session. But I'll start by giving a short summary uh, of each of the papers. So Hoffman and Beeler addressed pre-service teachers' views of Klein's double discontinuity. Uh, they looked at strengthening notions of congruence and symmetry via exploring various axiomatic systems in geometry courses. They did this with the help of interface e-portfolios and interface and reflection tasks. And they investigated the benefits and effects in terms of pre-service teachers' professionalization processes. Cook and colleagues looked at the use of conceptual analysis as a way to strengthen mathematical connections between university and school mathematics, in particular, as they related to the concepts of inverse and equivalence. They showed how a conceptual analysis can to lead to new insights on different concepts in mathematics and how productive engagement with school math content can be supported with respective tasks in university teacher education. Next, Shiner and Bosch provided a theoretical comparison of how various different research traditions have looked at this relationship between school and university mathematics. They position Klein, Schulman, and Cheviard is operating along different levels with respect to each. And they stress in their paper that cultural, ethical, and socio-political ideas, and not just logical and epistemological ones, need to be considered. Bookbinder and Macron, who we'll be hearing more from later on in this talk, focused on bridging the disciplinary practice of reasoning and proving and the teaching of secondary mathematics in a specially designed capstone course. Manilow and Glenady explored the use of a dihedral calculator in an abstract algebra course, and their article uh, considers how emphasizing visualization, making, and mathematical structure can foster mathematical awareness and disciplinary ways of being that they consider essential for the teaching profession. 
Uh, Wasserman, this was my contribution to this special issue, developed the construct of pedagogical mathematical practices, specifically studying the kinds of mathematical practices that teachers also found valuable from a pedagogical perspective. From the study, I posited the four disciplinary practices that might be a productive starting point in the university math courses because of their dual pedagogical nature. Next, Epkarian and colleagues considered inquiry-oriented approaches to instruction in a differential equations class. They describe, they describe how inquiry-oriented coursework can shape prospective teachers' perceptions of various conceptions of derivative and the notion of rate of change more generally, and simultaneously shape their views of the importance of class communication, argumentation, and inquiry in relation to their own instruction. Kerwin, Windsor, and Barker studied the relationship between university instructor actions and opportunities for future teachers in those courses to integrate their knowledge of mathematics, learners, and pedagogy. Almendinger, S. Laxon, and Buchholz considered the teacher-student perspective, in particular by capturing prospective teachers' mathematical orientation as an analytic category and their learning in university math courses. By analyzing pre-service teachers' reflections, they explored and described connections that university math courses can provide when aimed at these student teachers. Lyon colleagues examined how a university course helped develop pre-service teachers' value of mathematically intensive core teaching practices, as well as their motivation and expectancy to enact these practices in future classrooms. Next, Pinto and Cooper studied the interplay between tertiary and secondary probability in an experimental university course in which secondary teachers and practicing mathematicians jointly analyzed dilemmas that, arise, that, that arose in videos of classrooms working on probability problems. Burroughs and colleagues looked at the use of analyzing fictitious student work as a genre of mathematical tasks in a variety of university math courses. And then the ways in which these tasks seem to deepen student knowledge and also shape their beliefs about mathematics as a human activity. And lastly, Hoffman and Evan consider the role of learning about applied mathematics as it relates to and contributes to teachers' classroom work in terms of the process of mathematical modeling and a repertoire of interesting mathematical applications. They were specifically interested in how applications can provide an adequate image of the discipline. This is the collection of papers that makes up the SI. And again, I simply want to um, say both congratulations and a genuine thank you uh, for the authors who contributed to this. Um, we think it is a really nice collection of papers around this special issue. The other thing that I get to do um, is, uh, is give a brief overview of a portion of the survey paper um, that the three editors worked on uh, that introduces the special issue. And namely, what I'll do here is simply uh, describe a summary figure that captured some theoretical distinctions regarding university mathematics and secondary teacher education, as well as relationships between them, which we called from exploring the literature. In general, the distinctions sort of identified in the relations, uh, they identify aspects and approaches on which we might focus efforts in this area. So first, the distinction between school and university mathematics. This goes back to Felix Klein. And we situate these as lying within a plane of mathematical concepts. That is, concepts, the concepts that constitute school mathematics, perhaps things like linear functions, are different than those that are studied at the university level. This might be things like groups. A critical point in the literature is that there's a gap observed between these. And we've tried to depict that gap in this plane. It's important to note that uh, subsequently in this figure, we capture that gap with these two. The donut shape is the university mathematics and the school mathematics a circle. These are intended as disjoint, even though they surround each other. The circular depiction uh, maintains that gap. It also uh, might be somewhat pro provocative in the, in, the, in the sense that it 
Many might consider school mathematics to be a subset of university mathematics, and perhaps it forces us to wrestle a little bit more with how we relate these two on this plane. Regardless, we've tried to depict that gap that's described in the literature. Second is the distinction between mathematical concepts, which we have here, and mathematical practices and beliefs. These are things like proving or defining, or the belief that mathematics is a fixed or dynamic body of knowledge. We depicted these as the foundation of this plane because all of the concepts um, on that surface level are informed by these kinds of underlying practices and beliefs. We've depicted these somewhat as underlying this entire plane um, sort of across all of the distinctions above, um, but it's something that we might consider. And the last is a distinction between the mathematical, which we have here, and the didactical, uh, which in general we mean, we use to indicate mathematics specific pedagogy. Here we've essentially mirrored the structure of the mathematical plane to form a didactical plane, which includes similar distinctions, including this distinction between teaching of school mathematics and the teaching of university mathematics. Again, the, the addition of this plane is really meant to acknowledge that there is a meaningful distinction that we want to capture between, for example, the school math concepts that are on the upper mathematical plane and the teaching of those school mathematics concepts captured in the didactical plane. So these various distinctions give us um, some important ones that uh, are identified in the literature they give us a framework that we can now subsequently explore some of the different relationships, which capture goals, challenges, and approaches that others uh, have, have existed in the literature around this theme of university mathematics courses that are in service of secondary teacher preparation. These will capture ways people have talked about these university math courses as a part of um, and in service to this goal of secondary teacher preparation. So first, a relation, Klein's identification of this gap between university and school mathematics pointed to an opportunity that he also captured, which was about forming and better articulating connections between these two spaces. Namely, these were mathematical connections between university and school mathematics depicted on this mathematical plane. Much of his work had, had sort of a direction to it in that he typically began from university mathematics and then showed how we might view and develop school mathematics in relation to that perspective. But others have complemented this with the reverse perspective that might begin with school mathematics and show how university mathematics might be viewed from there. In general, when we look at these relationships in the literature, the idea is to close this gap by identifying mathematical connections that help, um, that help close this gap. The point is to make the transition teachers face in their mathematical studies, and then later to their future profession, a little smoother and more coherent. In other words, one of the ways people have talked about university math courses in service uh, of teacher preparation is around sharpening mathematical connections. We capture this with this relation depicted here. Second, from the literature, we see a different sort of emphasis um, that, that connects to mathematical practices and mathematical beliefs. With the primary relation to teacher education being that these practices and beliefs should inform didactical ones. We see this explicit highlighting of disciplinary practices as a way to address the gap between these two planes, the gap between the mathematical plane and the didactical plane between mathematical study and the didactical preparation to teach. And people have talked about the use of mathematical practices as a way of bridging that gap. Third, while there's a distinction between teaching university and teaching school mathematics, we've seen some relate these two as a potential opportunity in teacher education. That preparation to teach school mathematics might happen and be informed by the didactical approaches taken in university mathematics coursework. At some level that these might, for example, model didactical practices and concepts that could be used to bridge this gap on the didactical plane, 
This is something that remains in as a way of relating things on this didactical plane. Essentially, it's co-opting what Lordy talked about as the apprenticeship of observation, but for positive purposes. And fourth, we also see ideas in the literature around relating university mathematics concepts to particular situations in teaching school mathematics, which is another bridge between the mathematical and didactical planes. This bridge, this bridges the gap between these two in essence by considering how to apply mathematical ideas to school teaching. We drew arrows from both school and university to signify that it is the coming together of both of these things, and not just one or the other, that connects to the school uh, mathematics teaching. This has been explicitly done in literature in both directions, again, where one might start with teaching situations on the bottom plane and ask what university mathematics might be related to these, as well as uh, others that have started with the university mathematics on the upper plane and ask how it might influence teaching situations. The critical point is about bridging this gap between the mathematical and the didactical by finding and identifying particular applications between them. This is a brief summary um, of you know, what was um, part of the survey paper, this figure that tried to capture from the literature some of the important distinctions made um, between university math courses and their place in teacher education, as well as the relationships. It hopefully gives us uh, a sense of some of the important concepts um, and relations in this space, um, which might help us understand some of the challenges, as well as the potential solutions that might be productive in making progress. This is again, a short summary of the survey paper, but we're looking forward to hearing from um, some of the other authors of papers that might help flesh this out. What I'm gonna do now is stop sharing my screen and allow for the first presenter. So uh, Orly, I believe that is you. Yes, and Sharon will start us and then we'll switch to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, and hopefully everyone can see my screen. So we are um, looking at the disciplinary process, and um, I just want to start by thanking the uh, the editors of ZDM and the editors of the, editors of the special issue for inviting us to present today. So my name is Sharon McCrone, and I'm here with my colleague Orly Bookbinder from the University of New Hampshire to share a brief overview of our recently published article, Preparing Prospective Secondary Teachers to Teach Mathematical Reasoning and Proof, the Case of the Role of Examples Improving. Our study aims to address the double discontinuity between school mathematics, university ma mathematics, and teacher preparation with a focus on the practice of proof. Despite nearly 30 years of research on reasoning and proving, there is still little theoretical and practical knowledge on how to support teachers making connections between mathematical proof at the university level and their future classroom practice. To address this problem, we conducted a multi-year design-based research project in which we developed a course to enhance mathematics teachers' preparation for teaching proof and reasoning and studied the effectiveness of the course. The course and related assessments were refined through three iterations of the design and research cycle. And here we present on the culmination of these cycles. To frame our research, we called upon the work of many in the realm of mathematical knowledge for teaching and knowledge for teaching proof. We note that each type of knowledge defined here can also be characterized by related classroom practices. This framework also went through various iterations and was utilized to inform the design of the course and the related assessments. As the course and our research evolved, we identified three design principles. The design principles in the course activities aimed to first refresh and enhance the prospective secondary teacher's subject matter knowledge of proof. Secondly, or sometimes simultaneously, the course activities focused on developing pedagogical connections between pre-service teachers' knowledge of proof and the secondary curriculum, and to increase their awareness of common student difficulties with proving. 
Lastly, we sought to advance the prospective secondary teacher's ability to create or modify mathematical tasks that integrate proof and reasoning across a range of mathematical subjects and grade levels and practice appropriate pedagogical strategies in actual classroom settings. As the slide indicates, we identify the design principles as crystallizing, connecting, and applying. The course, titled Mathematical Reasoning and Proving for Secondary Teachers, consisted of four instructional modules based on four proof themes we identified in the liter literature as challenging for students to learn and teachers to teach. The course started and ended with the prospective teachers completing surveys to assess their mathematical knowledge for teaching proof and their disposition toward proof and the teaching of proof to secondary students. Each module of the course is set up the same way with activities to crystallize understanding of content and knowledge of logical aspects of proof, to connect to students' conceptions of proof in the classroom and apply or enact in secondary classrooms. This article and today's webinar focuses on the third module or the theme quantification and the role of examples improving. And now I think I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Orly to present the rest. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. So the research questions that we examine in the paper are specific to the third module of the course. How do prospective secondary teachers' knowledge and practices related to quantification and the role of examples improving change due to their participation in the course? And how did the course activities contribute to the observed changes in PST's knowledge and practices? By this, we mean both the declarative knowledge outlined in the MKTP framework and the classroom practices associated with each facet of mathematical knowledge for teaching program. To respond to our questions, we collected data over the whole project period from 34 PSTs who took the course. All of them had previously completed a course on proof and at least one more proof intensive undergraduate mathematics courses. We used multiple data sources um, like MKTP questionnaires, dispositions for proof surveys, uh, PSTs lessons and reflections. We used 360 degree videos of the course sessions and of the teaching in local schools. We used a variety of analytic techniques to analyze the data, both qualitative and quantitative methods and triangulating different sources of data. Um, the overview of the results, and we definitely encourage you to go and read the paper in more detail, which has a lot of things there. But the main claim that we have tried to advance in the paper was that the PST's knowledge and practices specific to this proof topic, quantification and the role of examples in proving, improved due to their participation in the course. And this improvement was supported by course activities and structure. We support this claim with several types of evidence, um, like improved performance on the MKTP questionnaires portion of items, assessing specifically quantification and all of examples improving. We bring evidence from specific activities of the Q quantification and the all of examples improving uh, module and the specific activities, and I will describe this a little bit more in details later. We provide evidence of PST's learning based on the analysis of their lesson plans, in particular the tasks they developed, and their own explanations of the roles of examples improving adjusted to the secondary students' level. We also show evidence of learning from reflecting on the, on the enacted lessons using the lens of teacher noticing. Today we want to share with you some evidence from, uh, from the course activity. What can you infer from this example? Before that, quick overview of the module quantification, the role of examples improving. There were three in-class activities with some work completed by prospective teachers in between. The activity, what can we infer from these examples had two parts, one structured around the false universal statement and one um, with the true existential statement. I'll say more about this later. Another activity was focused on comparing quantified and non-quantified statements in the context of true or false versus always, sometimes, never types of questions. In both activities, the main focus was on crystallizing PST's mathematical knowledge of proof 
in the quantification of the role of examples in proving this specific topic. And the connect aspects was manifested in the use of secondary mathematical content and the follow-up discussions, analyzing classroom scenario and writing its continuation, all sorts of aspects that are more related to the pedagogical uh, focus of the um, activities. And these in-class um, in activities were followed by the lesson implementation cycle, where prospective teachers developed, taught, and reflected on a lesson. So um, this is a snapshot of part one of the what can you answer from this example activity. The PSTs were given a statement and asked to determine its truth value and to justify their reasoning. Then they examined five or six examples related to the statement and asked to determine for each example what can be inferred about the statement from this example. Then we asked them again about the truth value of the statement. The PST did this online on their own and discussed their responses in class. Um, this table shows the distribution of PST responses and justifications before and after examining the, the collection of examples. First, we can see that almost all PSTs correctly identified the given statement as false, but only six of them also correctly justified their response with a counterexample. After analyzing the set of examples, then there was an increase in the number of correct justification from six to 17, and concurrently the number of incorrect justifications decreased. A problematic outcome was the increase from zero to eight in the number of both correct and incorrect counterexamples. It suggests that the PSTs maintained their initial correct idea while also accepting correct counterexamples as legitimate. Again, all this occurred as PST worked on the tasks on their own, and the issues were clarified and resolved during the class discussion. To summarize, um, we realized that adding a whole course with a focus on proof may not be feasible for most universities with a pre-existing course structure. We were able to do that by creating a separate section for, in the existing course for future teachers to experience um, the applications of proof. However, what we want to emphasize and we try to emphasize in the paper is the broader implications of our study. Specifically, our study shows how the three design principles of crystallize, connect, and apply, which are grounded in the literature, can be integrated in a holistic design, embodied in specific activities, and provide three types of learning opportunities within the context of a single course. Also, the course activities intended to strengthen the disciplinary connections between university level knowledge of proof and secondary school mathematics. And with that, thank you so much. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And already for sharing the screen. And then we might go to our next over to our next presenter, who is Vince Kirvin. And uh, it's Matthew Windsor and David Barker. So I guess, Vince, you are sharing the screen now. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, and maybe so. before you start, I want to remember the audience, if there are questions to the respective papers, you can already put them in the chat and we will have the Q&A at the end where you can also address questions to all the authors that are present. Please, Vince. Okay. So thank you for inviting us to be able to present today. I'm joined, are you, hang on one moment, I wanna make sure that slide, there it goes, okay. So thank you again for inviting us to present today. I'm joined with my colleague, Matthew Windsor, and he's gonna be presenting with me, but this work that we're sharing today was conducted also with a third colleague, David Barker. We're specifically gonna be talking about instructional actions that course instructors of mathematics courses um, took in conjunction with potential knowledge integration and the resource leveraging across courses within the program. Okay, my turn. Um, so pre-service teachers have the daunting task of learning how to teach. This includes learning relevant mathematics and pedagogy, as well as how students learn mathematics. Often uh, pre-service teachers gain their teaching knowledge in two or three different departments on campus. 
Moreover, uh, the mathematics that pre-service teachers learn at the college level seems to have nothing to do with the mathematics they will be teaching and we're familiar with as high school students themselves. Pre-service teachers then have to take what they have learned in college and integrate it in a meaningful manner to help students learn mathematics. Our research examines how university mathematics instructors can help pre-service teachers start to integrate their teacher, their teaching knowledge. Next slide, please. Um, in our content course for senior level pre-service secondary teachers, we looked for instructor actions that seem to promote potential knowledge integration. In our paper, we describe the content course in uh, more detail. Next slide, please. This diagram um, is how, uh, shows how we conceptualize knowledge integration. Uh, this conceptualization is grounded in schema theory and the literature on knowledge integration. We decided to focus on the knowledge of mathematics, pedagogy, and learners. In the teaching process, there are two mechanisms related to knowledge integration. Decision-making requires the teacher to make use of connected knowledge to give students access to the content. And reflection helps teachers to connect different knowledge nodes as well as strengthen existing uh, connections. Next slide, please. Now we teach our content course for senior uh, pre-service teachers in tandem with the final pedagogy course for the same seniors. Um, our review, the one review of our paper noted that Cohen's uh, work seemed to be applicable to our work. Uh, we noted that the content and the pedagogy course each provide resources toward prom promoting potential knowledge integration. Such resources include, but are not limited to, um, the content learned in each course, the pedagogy employed in each course, instructors, professional experiences, etc. Uh, moreover, pre-service teachers' experiences as learners in each course are important resources for potential knowledge integration. Your turn, Vince. And so with this information in mind and our interest in examining instructional actions, we designed and conducted a qualitative study using ethnographic methods. And so we collected field notes from every class session that was occurring for that content course. And these field notes included many direct quotes, both from the instructor as well as from the individual PSTs, pre-service teachers in the course as well, in addition to the narration of the events that were occurring during the course. Following the collection of these field notes, that was expanded upon and triangulated further by using artifacts from the course, whether they were lesson plan materials or itineraries from the instructor, as well as course materials that the PSTs in the course had been completing in conjunction. Following the collection of these field notes, it was a large amount of information and we had to be able to reduce how much we were working with and we did this by identifying what we referred to as episodes. These were a section of the field notes that was focused on a single idea. We identified these by going through and reading the field notes independently, identifying those portions that were focused on that single idea, and then meeting to discuss what we had identified. We adjusted both to the description of what an episode was, as well as the identification in the field notes, and we iterated this process of working independently and then coming together to talk until we had 100% consistency across episodes that we had identified as in our description stabilized. Then we worked within those episodes to repeat the same type of process, but instead we were looking for evidence of statements regarding mathematics, learners, or pedagogy. We also went through and operationally defined those and worked independently and then met to go through and repeat the same process to get our descriptions of those um, statements of mathematics, uh, learners and pedagogy, as well as their identification within the episodes consistent. We concluded our work on this once we had 100% consistency in the individual identification and descriptions of mathematics, learners and pedagogy. So of the episodes that had two distinct types. So for example, maybe mathematics 
and learners both occurred during that episode, we referred to these as episodes that contained evidence of potential knowledge integration. And we refer to this as potential because these are all cognitive processes that were occurring with participants and we're looking at external evidence that we're inferring about what is occurring in their cognition. Following these potential knowledge integration episodes that we had identified, we then use the constant comparative method to be able to go through and look within the field notes uh, closely related to those episodes to identify what instructional actions had occurred just prior to those episodes where there was potential knowledge integration. This led to the aggregation of a variety of instructional actions, as well as potential knowledge in integration episodes that you can see displayed in this table. In the left-hand column, you'll see the instructional actions, and you can see that there's a variety of them, as well as a variety of different potential knowledge integration episodes. Not every single potential knowledge integration episode contained knowledge of mathematics, learners, and pedagogy, but there was a variety in them. The one that we are going to focus on today is going to be what we refer to as focus on student thinking. You can see that this was one of the most common types of instructional actions that was occurring during the course, indicated by the total aggregate in the rightmost column. And you can also see that it was most commonly associated with knowledge of mathematics and learners occurring. But there were also many instances where both mathematics, learners, and pedagogy were also present. So what is focus on student thinking? We um, went through and described these as whenever the instructor was considering or had the pre-service teachers consider or just through the co uh, conversation and discussion that was occurring in the class, the PSTs organically brought up and were considering how would a secondary school student think about a specific mathematics topic? And so in the example that we're going to show here, what had been occurring during the course was that the pre-service teachers had been examining transformations, compositions, and this had also followed examining group structure um, prior to this as well. And then the instructor had then prompted the PSTs to consider when you're working with your secondary students, what might happen with their work in transformations. And so the instructor, Dr. Jones, was having the pre-service teachers consider the function, the opposite of the square function that had been increased by one. And so one of the pre-service teachers commented that a secondary stu student might go and apply these transformations by going and then shifting that graph up vertically by one unit and applying that translation, and then also reflecting it across the x-axis. But then another PST, proposed, well, what if that secondary student did that, but they swapped the order? And so the instructor, Dr. Jones, then went and applied those transformations, generating the graphs of them. And this immediately then turned the conversation into, wait, the graphs aren't the same. So what would I do if I was teaching secondary school students and they did this? Like, what do I do now as a teacher? And so this is only one possible example of what focus on student thinking looked like, but we felt that it was a very um, compelling, evident, uh, compelling case for where we have a natural conversation occurring that really looks at a secondary school topic and looks at what happens whenever students are working with that topic and what do we do as a teacher if my students did, were working with that topic. And although this was only one potential example of what it might look like to leverage focus on student thinking in a content course in university. Um, there were other ways that we saw potential implications. For example, rather th um, uh, than asking the PSTs to go through and hypothesize and consider what might secondary school students think, what if the instructor was to bring in potential secondary student work or potential st secondary student um, thinking that might occur? What if PSTs were going through and examining mathematical work such that was going on at a clinical placement that was occurring during um, another concurrent course, course like the pedagogy course that was taught in conjunction with this and how those resources might be able to be leveraged across courses? Because that's one of the big themes that we're wanting to emphasize and that we were working towards in this paper is that there are a large variety of resources that are at play um, 
both to instructors within university courses, but also to the pre-service teachers taking those courses during their preparation. And what might we do as instructors in those university courses to help really incorporate and bring in those to be able to leverage them to um, help pre-service teachers integrate their knowledge in ways that are authentic and realistic to the work that they will be doing as a teacher in a secondary school classroom. If you're interested in more information, we'd encourage you to please read our paper, but if you wanna contact us directly, you can see that contact information on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Uh, you might uh, stop share your screen. And um, so we will have another short presentation of one of the papers now, and then we will uh, follow up with uh, 30 minutes of discussion. So we will have a lot of time also for discussion afterwards. And I encourage you to pose already your questions directly to the authors of the paper now in the chat so that they can also answer you directly. Um, However, after the last presentation now of Yvonne Lay and her colleagues, we will have some discussion time. Yvonne, please go on. All right. Well, thank you, first of all, so much to Orly and Nick and Niels for the invitation, Gabriella for her support, and of course, all the other authors and editors for making this such a great volume. Um, and I'm really so excited to see uh, I think I saw 70 people in this um, in this webinar, and so I, I'm glad to be part of this larger international village for making secondary teacher uh, education better. Um, before beginning, I just want to draw your attention to a, a virtual handout at tinyurl.com slash modules ZDM, or I guess ZDM, depending on where you're from. Uh, and it's just... Uh, it just might be helpful for seeing our perspective on the relevant research constructs. Okay, so this work is only possible with a village, and I'm here to represent an entire modules team. We've spent the last six years on this labor of love to improve high school math teacher education, and our results come from focusing on both instructional design, as in what happens when the instructors get into the classrooms and are looking and using our materials, and also building into those materials explicit connections to math teaching practice. So this study was partially funded by the US National Science Foundation, and I wanna issue the standard disclaimer. We have materials for algebra from an advanced perspective uh, and also uh, field theory, geometry, statistics, and uh, mathematical modeling. Uh, and you should check them out. All right, so earlier this hour, we saw this geography of the double discontinuity that was in the review and presented here by Nick. And on this map, I just wanna point out where modules is looking at, which is we look at university and secondary mathematics and also university and secondary math teaching. So as Nick posited, maybe provocatively, these spaces are all conceptualized here as distinct. And I would say, and I guess modules would say that there's actually not just one disconnection within this discontinuity, there's actually a four-way disconnection. Or uh, if you wanna be precise, maybe there's even a four choose two equals six-way disconnection. And what we on the modules project want to do is we want to try to bring these domains together, at least in the teacher's own experiences. And by teacher, I mean prospective secondary mathematics teacher. And so to do this, we put forth this hypothesis that there is a way of seeing these domains, university content, secondary content, university didactics or teaching practices, and secondary teaching practices as mutually informing. Um, at least in the context of teacher education. And our hypothesis is that how we teach and what we teach has to make bridges in two ways, at least. And these two ways are one, teachers need to engage in some sort of simulations of core teaching practices. And these simulations should be showing the teachers through experience how the content taught in a university math course can actually help them teach better. And two, the university instructor themselves has to actually use these core teaching practices when they're teaching the teachers. And together we call this instructional coherence, uh, which is uh, a phrase that we learned from Maria Tato and I think also, and we think also applies here. 
I want to give you an example of what we mean by an application of content to teaching. And uh, I saw in the chat that there was uh, a reference by Eben Christensen to practice-based teacher education. So one way that we can also think about applications of math to teaching is, or content to teaching is that approximations of practice or simulations of practice or simply application problems. And we are part of a larger movement to try to bring these in to uh, secondary teacher education in the math courses. All right, so here's an example. Uh, so first of all, suppose that you are teaching high school algebra and you assign this task. And the task says, the graph of an equation in X and Y uh, is defined such and such. What are the Y intercepts of this? Oh, by the way, the task may not include the uh, the definition, but it might definitely include the, what are the Y intercepts of, the, of this equation? And this is a task given in the high school level. Um, and then the core practice, the core teaching practice here is going to be to promote discussion and to elicit thinking and in ways that are rooted to mathematics disciplinary practices. All right. So with that in mind, here is a dialogue that you might see among these hypothetical students. And your job as a secondary teacher is to respond to these students. So we want, we ask the teachers, video record yourselves talking to these students and you're gonna send us the instructor, the video recording so that we can give you feedback on it. All right, so in our algebra materials, we focus on elementary algebra from an advanced perspective, which means that we go into depth uh, on the definition of graph and equation, the definition of coordinates and intercepts. And then we ask these teachers to use these ideas as a way to frame their noticing. But we also want to frame teachers to frame their noticing through seeing students' strengths. And we support our instructors in framing their instructor in this way as well. That means that we provide tasks where teachers can really dig in and say what they're thinking. And then we also suggest ways that instructors can then build on teacher talk and teachers can build on teacher talk. Instructional coherence sounds really great. And what we've heard uh, and seen throughout the ZDM special issue, as well as from Orly and Sharon today and Vince and Matthew and David all support this idea. In the modules project, we saw a fantastic opportunity to examine this idea more robustly because we had an opportunity to look across four very different content areas and look at more than 30 institutions. What we wanted to know was would this kind of hypothesis results, hy um, hypothesized results hold across those content domains and how would teachers benefit? Could they benefit both cognitively in terms of their content knowledge for teaching and affectively in terms of their motivation to use core practices in their future teaching and how much they might value it. So here I've color coded the cognitive and affective. So we had different, we had different samples for each of these questions. All right, so the short answer is yes. And so I encourage you to read our papers for more detail. In brief, these are graphs that show pre and post content knowledge for teaching assessment results and pre and post expectation of success for carrying out some of these core teaching practices. And you can see increases in both. Our handout gives you a little bit more information about our instrumentation and how we're conceptualizing these constructs. Why should we believe that instructional coherence can explain these results? Here's a logical argument. If we are applying math teaching in a way that draws on the university math, this should mean that teachers are getting these core practices enforced. And if they see their instructor modeling these core teaching practices, it might encourage the teachers to want to do these later and to feel more confident because they're actually seeing this come to life. And the other and the other reason that we think that instructional coherence explains our results is because of what teachers said in open-ended surveys. So across more than 70 comments that we saw, we see evidence, um, we see evidence that they even that they noticed these core practices, that they found the applications of content to teaching useful, and that the course curriculum and instruction worked for them. And so these are some of the representative quotes. Uh, so some people say that they learned how content could be understood more rigorously and more deeply, and that the problems that they were presented with in class did have multiple solutions approaches and that they could talk to other teachers and learn from them. 
And also we had plenty of people say that they found these applications to teaching really helpful um, and useful. So this one says, I learned through the video assignment that questioning is key to getting secondary students to make a deeper understanding. All right, so reflecting on the problem of disconnection, one theme that we're hearing among all of the talks today is that curriculum materials can make a difference. Um, and then we can see that in the issue as well. And one lesson that we take from the modules work is that ultimately we might need change in the curriculum materials. We also need change in how teachers are participating in the math and how instructors are participating in their didactical practices. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. You might stop sharing your screen and Nick, you might start. Share the screen for the, our question and answers panel. So I would like the audience to think of questions and to come up with questions also to the authors and us editors who are present. And um, we have prepared some questions um, to start with and maybe it's a good idea if everybody gathers ideas for good questions to start with one question, at least from our side, Nick, if you could move to the next slide. So we are interested in the big picture. We have now assembled authors from all over the world and thinking about uh, how to improve the mathematics courses. And the question is, what would it look like for our field to build on the results of your study or the research that we have now gained so far, or the findings that we have from the special issue, how should the field move forward? Please think about that for a little and would be nice if you share your thoughts with us. Okay, I'm being voluntold to be the first one to uh, respond. Um, uh, uh, yes, then small mathematics, this uh, we uh, normally think of half. And I am not sure what was that. Uh, apologies, but there is a Manu Thomas here who already has disturbed. I will try to exclude him. Very sorry about that. Okay. We, already expected, we already expected this problem. OK. Um, OK. So um, I think um, maybe rather than kind of jumping in and, um, ex and responding directly to this question, I think that as we were, um, as we were listening to the um to the presentations but also from reading of the paper which i was you know the, um, i was fortunate enough to be to have an opportunity to read the papers um as a part of my role um as a co-editor i feel that there are a lot of um a lot of things that are common across different um different works of people and thinking one also mentioned this that there are different directions that really think about um, about this integration of mathematical ideas. And um, the literature does talk about those disconnections and we can, you know, it doesn't matter the number of those disconnections, but I think the ideas of, um, there is some convergence, at least uh, for me coming from reading the papers and listening to the uh, to different presenters today of the, understanding of though all those pieces are important and there are ways and some of those ways are very successful in order to integrate them within the um, within the context of um, of mathematics courses and whether those mathematics courses specifically for teachers or whether those mathematical courses are um, you know going concurrently with others so the different different structures, 
um, with, within which institutions have those programs. And across these differences, we do see that there are many things that are connecting. And this seems to be an understanding and also commitment on behalf of the, of, um, of the research community um, or the village, as in Bonn called this, to bridge those gaps and bring them together. So in terms of our study, one of the things that, um, and even I've, I've been talking about this with Matthew and, and uh, Dave, is these instructor actions that we identified, we don't, we, we came across them almost a little bit unexpectedly. And so because we didn't really set out to test them as like a working hypothesis, but we just saw that they were correlated with them. That's one of the things that we're actually looking at and we think would be beneficial in general is like, to what extent are these replicable? Like how consistently do they go through and are they associated with these um, particular potential um, episodes with knowledge integration? Like basically how well do they work? And we kind of see this sort of in two ways. So one is um, both through like the development of curricular materials. And there's benefits and drawbacks, I think of this. Like curricular materials, one of their benefits is it makes some of the dissemination of them a little bit more manageable because it's sort of a self-contained item. In contrast, one of their downsides is, is that like really getting a well-defined uh, and developed and like really well-working set of curricular materials that are, comp uh, that are understood by anyone using it, that's challenging. Um, and they also tend to be really specific then because it's designed for a very specific topic, a very specific type of course. And so there's benefits and drawbacks for that. But then also on the other hand, well, what about if these instructor actions, like these, these were things, they were actions someone took in this particular course, that means that maybe they have the ability to also be able to be tested out in a variety of other settings. And it gives more flexibility too with them how could they basically be applied, but within different particular pieces of content? What if the specific content course changed? Does it matter if it's a mathematician versus a mathematics educator versus um, other instructors? Does it matter if it's in like a mathematics department versus a college of ed? Like there's a lot of variability and stuff that we just don't know about. What might it look like if someone is going and enacting these instructional, instructional actions in a variety of settings, the effects that they might end up resulting in. That's, I think, one of the big things that we're thinking about and that we're wanting to better understand is basically like, where do these actions um, lead, both in terms of consistency, the type of uh, ways in which they might be disseminated and enacted, as well as um, the space that they're being enacted in. Yes, and maybe Yvonne, you could also add something or think it even further. <laughs> uh, sure. So I think, um, let's see. So Vince, was that you? Yeah. So I think Vince and Orly point to both instruction and curriculum. I think that there's also this issue of educative curriculum. So the people that are teaching the courses for math courses for secondary teachers are often going to be mathematics faculty. And at least in the US, uh, it's not, it's very uncommon for a person in the university setting to also have some substantive teaching experience at the secondary level. And for me, there's a question uh, of, you know, what does it, what does it look like to help bring instructors to understanding what it means to even bring these kinds of connections that we've been talking about this whole time. Uh, and then there's also a question of what the longitudinal effects are. Uh, so if we have some hypothesis on how we're helping teachers build their knowledge or build their practices or integrate their knowledge, or, you know, for example, to look at uh, Amy's work to, you know, if they're using this tangible dihedral calculator, you know, and maybe building up dispositions that way, how do these how do these actually inform their first year of teaching, their second year of teaching, and um, and then and so on? Um, there's some results in the U.S. I think from the '80s or I want to say it's from the '90s that said that a content intervention for pre-service teachers. Uh, had more of an effect in their second year of teaching and a negligible effect in their first year of teaching. 
So I think that there's also a question of if there is some kind of effect, is there a lag? At what time does it come into play? And through what circumstances? Thank you very much. So maybe we have other questions from the audience. I encourage you to, to pose a question to our panel or even to all of the group. I mean, a lot of researchers internationally attend the webinar. And if this is also a topic you're doing research on, that's nice to have I just wanted to point one uh, to kind of um, respond for a moment, not respond, I mean, echo the um the sentiment of of Yvonne about this the importance of looking beyond the uh beyond what's happening in the course and um we do have um at the university of Niamshire, we do have a project that looks at the um specifically at the prospective teachers who have graduated from our course and from our program and that have took the course what does it mean for them in during their internship year and also during their first couple of years of practice to see if there is some um, quote unquote residue of what they have experienced as teachers during this course and whether there is reasoning and probing in what ways does it appear in their teaching. So we're kind of trying to address this question but um, obviously like thinking about scale that Vince uh, mentioned, it's um, it would take a community in order to test those hypotheses and um, do those explorations. I feel like um, if we go back to what uh, Vince uh, said and what Yvonne talked about, I feel like that all this special <laughs> issue starts to show that actually we should uh, kind of replace the curriculum that uh, traditionally teachers learn in the university and replace the instructors that you uh, traditionally used to teach uh, mathematics in the university. And then uh, the teachers get some contribution from academic mathematics studies. But then it seems to me a little bit like we like it's it's something different and we go very, very far from these traditional academic mathematical studies that currently teachers all over the world study. So my question to the group would be if, if how, how this transaction might done in a way uh, that maybe that, that uses the current uh, resources the teachers and the educational systems has that currently they they the 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 instructors and so how do we maybe do some little changes because such a big changes for in educational uh, uh, settings it's kind of impossible and also we will lose something um can i let me take a quick shot at that um so i i worked with vince my name's matthew windsor i forgot to tell you I just got so excited to present that I just dove right in. Um, one of the things in our instructor actions that we found is that they weren't big and grandiose. They were small and simple. Um, and I also think that in my in my professional experience in the different places I've been, um, a collaboration between, um, let's say a mathematician and math educator is very beneficial in this situation. I couldn't, you know, um, at our university, um, we teach the content course. So that's, we're like, for example, I'm teaching this course right now and I'm a, I have a PhD in mathematics education. Um, but I, but I strongly believe in collaborating with our mathematician colleagues. Um, and I think it, as, for example, if you're, so in the class, so uh, in the math in the math course, a mathematician could say, "I chose to do this problem because," or as I was thinking about this problem, or as I worked with students who think about this problem, this happened. They're sharing their own professional experience, which is valuable to pre-service teachers. Um, another thing, at least in our in our paper that we noticed, was that. Um, 
when our pre-service teachers did something in the math course, it's it served as a scenario in the pedagogy course. We could say yesterday in your math course, you did this and this and this, and your instructor did this and this and this. Now let's look at it through a pedagogical lens and see what's going on. So it seems like I realize that changing the education world is like trying to push a mountain. It's it's it's, it's very challenging, but I think that small collaborations can actually go a long way to do a lot of the things that have been talked about today. Agreed. I think that that's one of the biggest things that I can think of that is a small change is simply just talking to the people who are teaching the courses. So if some if uh, um, someone's uh, teaching a mathematics course that's being taught concurrently, um, what's the topic in the mathematics course? How could that, how could specific examples be used within a specialized course? So for example, like if students are studying modern or abstract algebra and they're studying groups and you're talking about transformations of functions and composition, how could you use an example involving transformations and composition to help illustrate what does group structure look like while directly tying it to what happens and the secondary school curriculum, and then also being able to use that as a springboard then for how do students think about that mathematics to examine what why things do or don't work. So there's a comment also from even Christiansen in the chat. Maybe even you can even say it, what you meant. Yeah, I don't know if I can make it much clearer, but I'm thinking um, on some of the work that argued for coherence between the message that students get when they go on teaching practice and the message they get at university. And there has been the counter argument that there is a point in actually meeting two slightly different perspectives or two slightly different discourses between theory and practice. And I'm, I was just wondering if there's a parallel here that there could be a point in, in engaging in the discourses of the mathematicians on the one hand and the discourses of school mathematics and mathematics education on the other hand, and that there's something to be said for operating in cross-discursive worlds that may be uh, so I'm not disagreeing with Yvonne that the coherence is very important, but that that there's also a point in in talking about this in ways that that we still want to have a, a, a dynamic meeting uh, taking place. So it was a comment. I want why are we getting all these questions about the correct value of pi and all this stuff? I find it a bit distracting. Sorry. May I respond to your comment, um, Eben? Yeah, so I think, um, so again, uh, Eben wrote that there's, uh, she said that there's, there, is there a point in student teachers experiencing the same issue from two different perspectives and having to do the mental and emotional work of making the discourses of university math meet the discourses of math education, et cetera. Um, and I, yes, I, I think that it does, it does require a lot of mental and emotional work, intellectual work, disciplinary work to bridge those discourses uh, of didactics and mathematics. For me and uh, from my own perspective and perhaps from the perspective of modules, I think that we hope that two of the things that help teachers do that work are both the curriculum as an educative curriculum, uh, as well as, um, well, maybe that's one of the main things is that the educative curriculum itself, and then the second one is the instructor themselves. Uh, and those work in concert. Uh, is I think if we, if we present math classes from some sort of, uh, I don't know, stereotypical perspective where all you're doing is, you know, even if you're doing applied, whether you're doing applied math or math modeling or statistics or, you know, proving theorems, uh, if that's the only discourse where the math course is living, and then on the other hand, in their uh, 
methodological in their didactics course, they're talking about whatever discourse they use there. There would be a lot, there's too much work to bridge them. But if we can start bringing in some of the discourse from one into the other, just like Matthew was saying in these like small and simple moves, I think that that can support teachers in doing that work, which is which is needed as they move into the field. And it shouldn't be only on them to do. I think the follow up. With can the you maybe of... stop sharing uh, the slide because if you see each other, um, it may be more lively. Thanks. I think to follow up on that, one of the major themes that I'm hearing is that experience matters. And anecdotally speaking, like that, that that is like when whether it's my own or when I'm talking to my own pre-service teachers, one of the things that really influences them are the people that they're working with, not only what's the course that they're taking. And so I think that those collaborations, those small adjustments, those small changes that help to both humanize as well as make it realistic and practical and practical and implementable, that's a really critical element. I agree with what was said here, and um, I do want to offer a little perspective that came out of uh, that came out of our research. Um, when uh, we had um, we had, like I mentioned, all of our all of our participants have previously taken uh, proof courses, um, at least one introduction to proof, and also some other courses that were heavy on proof side. Um, what we got from the um, from the reflections and from what uh, from our, from what our teachers said and wrote us back is that despite having taken those courses. Um, Attending to this one in particular, where there was such a big integration between the uh, between the pedagogy and specific proof, helped them to understand what they learned in the proof courses in a different way. So I want to make an argument that uh, it may not be a popular argument and. Um, it may not be an easy argument to apply in the context of different universities, but there is a value of when we're learning something in the mathematics course, like, the, like I'm taking proof as, as that's my bread and butter. Um, making tweaks within that course um, would have provided some connections for this for the for the teachers who took our course eventually, but that might not be enough because there is an issue of maturity and there is an issue of uh, maybe it maybe being of exposure to similar ideas and different points as somebody goes through the uh, through the teacher preparation program. And there may be not an easy way of saying, okay, we can just do little tweaks to our courses and everything would be uh, would be um, fine. Um, maybe both are needed, or maybe there is no simple solution to this, um, and there might be some structural things that can be done. So maybe like to summarize this point, I think both are needed within the mathematics courses, things that needs to be done that draw connections or applications to teaching, but also something that would have this, like package this and make it something with the more educational applications being centered in the course. Um, thank you, Orle. I think it is a very important distinction that you pointed out that, um... Uh, maybe we just, it's not only to change something that exists, but also to add something new. And in all of us, like in our settings around us, we have to, you know, but, but once we have this theoretical distinction, it is easier to, to see where I are going. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Marita. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, thank you so much. Um, Nils, I want you to go back to the slide you showed about the challenges. And I, I found these really interesting questions. Um, one challenge I uh, think is here in the field 
the question how we can build on each other's research because we have so many different contexts on university level, like different curricula, course systems, and so on and so on, and also on school level. So, um, and then, yeah, making connections between these is also challenging, of course. So I think this is one point, how much is the, well, context relevant that we teach in, and um, also as you were talking about the people and the social uh, factors as well. So I think this is really something we have to make very clear also in our papers, and I appreciate this a lot in the presentations, from which context we come and wh where we talk about and how this relates to other people's context so that other researchers understand where um, they could maybe connect or what is different as well. And I think it's also important to, um, well, to, um, well, compare results or understand better what works in, in this field for all of us. Yeah, just a comment. Maybe if I can add a bit uh, yeah, to no, that, no. Nick, um, from the perspective of the guest editors, I mean, we we have also been an, a very international team. And I remember that when we discussed how we should write the survey article, we were really learning from each other how it is in the other countries. And I found that personally really valuable and also seeing assembled all the papers from international working groups and instructors. And uh, I have collaborated with uh, Helma Aslaksen and Henrika Almendinger. Helma is also here today, a Norwegian colleague and a Swiss colleague, and we are an international group as well. So it's really um, very well, very good to see how things are done in a different context to transfer that to your own context and learn really that we're working also on the same problems because we have all the, the, the same intentions of making the mathematics for the um, teacher students more accessible. And then you really can, can come up with new ideas and be creative in your own context once you have this kind of view, this periphery view over your own uh, educational system, even if you can only act maybe in your own educational system. Well, I'll just add uh, another comment. One of the things I found really interesting about the collection of papers as a whole was that despite some of the varying contexts that existed that I think very much influence um, you know, the kinds of uh, practical things that different people are having to overcome. I found really nice points of overlap that 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 some of the different papers were, um, you know, finding similar things, you know, that that were valuable across these contexts um, that I think is is interesting. So the one I'm thinking about right now was this emphasis on student thinking from, you know, instructor action of making that visible, whether it's about secondary students or about, you know, the university students own thinking, uh, and that that was reflected in some other papers uh, as well, that this really um, had some value. And, and again, I think there were other points of overlap across these papers, um, you know, that, that seemed to have, you know, across contexts, some genuine value. Uh, and I think that's, um, both interesting to consider what those were, as well as um, give some ideas and direction about um, you know what's possible um, in that space. So, Niels, do I get to ask the um, a, a question for one of the slides to the panel? Yes, please go ahead. Go on, Nick. So uh, uh, I'm I'm interested um, for for the for the panel members. What what do you all think are the theoretical questions and challenges around this theme from the special issue that we as a field still need to better understand? I think you've talked maybe maybe some of them have been talked about, but um, what are some of those things um, that might 
point us towards future directions for study. So your thoughts. I have one thought. So when I was looking at the slides that you and Niels and Orly produced, uh, you know, and this diagram that you drew, it occurred to me that we as researchers in this room can look at that diagram and we can dissect, okay, well, what's university math and what's secondary math? What's the university didactics and what's the secondary didactics? And then, and then I began wondering as I, you know, as actually I was using this, you know, there is a disconnect. There are these disconnections. There are these discontinuities, which is all passive voice, right? And so then I began to wonder like, who is holding the disconnections? Who is holding the discontinuity? Is it, when we present the researcher perspective, we are positing and holding this discontinuity, but how do teachers hold it and how do teacher educators hold it? And how are these held differently or in incompatible or complementary ways across math and math education? Okay. Could you explain what do you mean by hold? How, to, how they hold? I think what, um, Anna, I think what I mean is when we see these, when we are positing these disconnections between, say, university mathematics and secondary mathematics, we know from the literature that secondary teachers might also see this, this disconnect. Um, but what about secondary, but what about the secondary di didactics and university didactics? You know, what are the what are the disconnects that teachers see and experience in those? And if we're trying to put forth a connection, how are they experiencing that connection and how might they conceptualize connections or disconnections? And then similarly, if we're another another two people that we have mentioned in, in this hour are math faculty and uh, pedagogical faculty. So how do those, how how would people in those two parties view these kinds of connections and disconnections? And do they also see them and hold them as, um, as discontinuities? Does that help? Kind of related to this, one thing I find myself wondering about, because this kind of goes back to the, the question of residue, which is a, another aspect that I'm really interested in if we have preparation, what actually leaves residue. So whenever teachers begin their careers, what are they leveraging? What are they drawing upon? What influences the actions that they are taking as a teacher in the classroom than with secondary students? And so one thing that whenever I think about disconnect, there's like what's going on internally and there's what's going on externally in terms of actions or behaviors. And one of the things that I've discovered from talking with some of my teacher candidates, my pre-service teachers in my courses is, well, I know that this, these things are related in this way, but I'm not able to do something about this while I'm in the classroom because of the teacher that I'm working with. Or I would love to be able to do this now that I'm in my second year teaching, but the school that I'm at requires that all math teachers for this course do dot, dot, dot. And so I, I, I think that it's almost twofold. Like one is like discontinuity um, between the knowledge and practices and values and beliefs that one holds, which are all internal. And then there's also the like system, the culture, the routines, the habits, the ways of doing and teaching mathematics that exist sort of outside the individual, but are like larger contextual things. And I guess that's one thing that is like really hard. I don't, I'm not even sure if to what extent this is possible that we can account for it in theoretical models because of how varied it is. But it is one thing that I find myself reading when I'm thinking about different papers with um, whether it's within this SI or just in general, what's going on internally and what's happening with how we're theorizing and constructing these and what isn't being accounted for because of where those theoretical models are being applied and the variation within the context and situations for where they're being applied. Uh, thank you, Vince. I, I, I noticed now there are some other responses. And of course, the discussion is really, really interesting now. But because of the time issues, we have to finish soon. So I would like to thank you and I would like to thank all participants. Uh, and I would like to thank especially the guest editors, so Orly, Nick and Nils for editing this special issue with all challenges and opportunities. <laughs> 
that come along with that. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope um, if you are interested in uh, this webinar, you can look again to uh, the YouTube channel that I posted uh, the link to. And of course, we stay in the discussion. We'll discuss uh, all these issues in person or virtually or via emails in the future. Thank you very much, you all from the CDM editorial team. Thank you. Bye-bye.